All right. How's everybody doing today? Everybody all right? I have one question for you. Anybody in the house love Jesus today? Yee! I love it. Come on, let's put our hands together here at Laker Branch for all of our family that's joining us online. Let's give it up for them, all of our locations around this incredible community. Hey, thank you guys for joining us today. I know there's a lot of places that you could have been, but you chose to be here, maybe by accident, maybe you were invited. Either way, you're welcome, and I believe that God is going to encounter you. My name is Bernard Scott. I'm the campus pastor here at Lakewood Ranch, and I'm honored and privileged to serve alongside of our lead pastor, Randy, and his wife, Amy, as we uh, really just love people, love God, help people find freedom, help people find their purpose, help people find family. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity to, to be a part of what God's doing through Bayside. I do believe like, uh, that this is the greatest church this side of heaven. That's my personal opinion, and I'm entitled to it. I just said it, all right? I may not be entitled to say it, but I can say it here, because this is my platform right now. So anyway, so I'm going to say it. Anyways, um, welcome. I'm glad you're here. I have a message that God's put on my heart for today. A couple weeks ago, I talked about uh, having the mind of Christ, and I talked about how in this world today, um, there is a battle for the mind, and I talked about the difference between the mind and the brain, and how the enemy can only get to your mind, and if he can get your mind thinking a certain way, then your mind communicates that to your brain, and your brain begins to have your body respond. And oftentimes, we miss out on what God's best for us because we allow the enemy to get in our mind. And the things that we take into our mind, we feed it. And as the more we feed it, depending on what you're feeding it, it grows. And it can either grow closer to God or grow, grow away from him, which then causes our body, our natural body, to respond to that. Well, I, there's so much more to say on that, but I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about something else. Y'all ready? But what I do have to say, you just need to know, I'm coming hard and I'm coming fast. All right? I'm just going to deliver what God's put on my heart. So get ready. Put your spiritual seatbelt on, clicking in. You may not have time to talk back to this preacher, but you are allowed to. You can say amen, uh-huh, oh, wow, ooh, that's good. You can clap, you can wave those cards, whatever you got to do. Uh, you can respond, or you just sit there and just go, mm. Wow, I have no idea what he just said. But we'll have a good time, all right? So I'm going to ask, so what I always do is I read the opening portion of Scripture and uh, I'm going to ask that you stand with me in honor of God's word. Why do I do that? Is I believe that people are standing for a lot of things. Why not stand for the word of God that has changed our lives and will continue to change our lives? I believe you make room for what you honor. Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 7, it says this. And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they did not prevail. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters have been thrown down, the one who accuses them before God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. Father, I ask that you would give me the words to say, that you would give us the ability to hear what your spirit is saying to us. Remove every hindrance and every distraction. And as we encounter your truth today, may we be set free to become all that you've created and redeemed us to be. In Christ's name I pray and everybody said, amen. amen. You may be seated. In that opening scripture, we see this picture of Satan Believe it or not, he was going before the throne of God and sometimes still will do the same to bring accusation against you and I. And he's kicked out of heaven. And as this war was raging, what's interesting is Jesus came to the rescue. 
And he says that they overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And also in this portion of scripture, which I thought was really interesting, it says Satan, devil, he deceives the entire world. Now remember, deception happens, it starts with the mind. He plants thoughts in your mind. And if he can get you to take the bait, next thing you know, you start to go down a path of deception. And this tool, which I believe, because God, in, in his sovereignty and his love for us, he says, look, I'm going to give you the opportunity to have the mind of Christ. I'm also going to give you another tool. I'm going to give you another tool to help you to understand that you are not a loser. You're a winner because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He says, they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. I'm going to explain what that means. And today, as I begin to share, you're going to help me preach today. How, what does that mean by that? So basically, what's going to happen is I'm going to uh, help us by uh, pointing out some functions of the blood of Jesus, and then we're going to apply it. We're going to apply it, and then I'm going to have you repeat some things with me, and we're going to allow that uh, revelation to come over our lives, because I am uh, convinced that the world is getting darker. Jesus said it would get darker. It's going to get more cray-cray and more cray-cray and more cray-cray, but... Jesus says we are in this world, not of it, and we have already won. We don't have to worry about being overcome by the world because Jesus already overcame it, and we can overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Now, I know this, that when I grew, I grew up in a black Pentecostal church. I mean, black Pentecostal church. <laughs> Where we get on a song and we sing that song for an hour <laughs> before we go to the next song. And we would get to, you know, we'd sing a song. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Right, we get to singing that. And an hour later, boy, we turn that church up, boy. We turn it up. <laughs> they were some good times. Some of y'all don't know anything about that. Maybe we just might have to break out one day and just a good old, just good old fashioned. <laughs> so I've been learning a lot about the blood because I, honestly, it's weird. I understand if if you've not had any, if you if you've not followed Christ for long or you don't even know and you hear Christians talk about the blood. I mean that's kind of nasty. Like, what is this, a cult or something? Drink the blood? Whoa, that's nasty. What's wrong with these people, right? But there's so much power in that, this blood of Jesus that we celebrate, we do through communion. It's, not, it's more than just a ritual. And I believe that sometimes it's easy for us to forget just how powerful it is and what it is doing for us. Now, this revelation has continued to come to me, but come to me, but I've been reminded because I suffered an injury about a month ago. I was sitting in church and I was invited to play golf, but I was planning on going after church, but sitting in church, God said, "Go now." So I left church. I never do that. But I did this day. I left, I went, got to the first hole and heard uh, I hit my second shot and on approach to the green, I hear a cry for help. I just go responding to the cry for help. Didn't hear it anymore, but I, I went inside a pool cage and I looked and I saw two boys in the bottom of a pool. I pulled them out in the process. I tore my rotator cuff, bicep tendon, so, uh, and I'm still going through the healing process. But in this healing process, um, you know, they told me I had to do surgery, but I'm like, well, I'm going to see if Jesus can heal me. And then part of the procedure I've been doing is taking my own blood, having that blood put in this area and allowing the body to heal itself because there's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. And so as I'm going through this process, I mean, healing is taking place, y'all. Y'all just need to know healing is taking place and I'm thankful for it. But I've begun to learn all of these things, the function of the blood uh, in the natural what your blood does in your body. In fact, we know life is in the blood. And Leviticus 17, 11 said this, for the life of the body is in its blood. I have given you the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with the Lord. It is the blood given in exchange for a life that makes purification possible. 
If you're not convinced how powerful blood is, try living without it. Can you imagine? No, you can't because your body can't function without the blood. In the natural, the blood, um, it replenishes nutrients. It takes nutrients to all the different organs of your body. It takes oxygen. Uh, it removes waste. It repairs injuries. It regulates body temperature. Causes homeostasis. homeostasis. It allows you to stay kind of balanced. Well, in the same way that our natural blood brings life to our body and brings these things to our physical body, so does the blood of Jesus Christ to the body of Christ. If you think about it, or if you were to think about it, and that's what I want to do today, is I want to show you, just as the natural blood is to our physical body, the blood of Jesus is to our spiritual body. And so, because of the blood of Jesus, we can be replenished. We can have nutrients, which that means is that, man, although this world brings chaos, I can have peace because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That it literally removes waste. The blood removes waste. Just think about the number of things that we're exposed to on a daily basis that we have no control over, the toxins that are in our air and all of that. Well, our blood and our body literally carries the things that shouldn't be there out into our liver and our kidneys, and there's this cleaning, cleansing process, and it eliminates the waste. Well, think about it spiritually. Because of the blood of Jesus, all of the things that the enemy tries to throw at us that tries to clog our system, Jesus' blood cleanses us and allows us to have purity. So then... Of course, it repairs injury and it regulates the body temperature. Now, I know that there's a lot of things that we face in life where we're injured uh, on this earth. People hurt us. Things hurt us. There are events that happen. And, uh, but the blood of Jesus heals, and I'm going to get into that. Um, one of the things that I learned was that in the Old Testament, and I used to ask these questions all the time, because they had to kill a lot of animals to pay for their sin. You say, what does that mean? So when you read the Old Testament, some of y'all skip it because it's like, "Ah, it's too deep for me, it's nasty too. I mean, they're killing a lot of animals. But this is what they had to do. There was a system that was instituted by God from the first time that Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Remember, they sinned, they ate of the tree that God said not to eat of. So they immediately hid and then they took leaves and tried to cover their nakedness. Well, That was their attempt to cover the shame. They were now disconnected from God. And so God, the first thing he did was clothe them with animal skin. Well, what does that mean? That means an animal had to be sacrificed in order for them to be covered. So God instituted this system that says in order for man to be, quote unquote, covered for their sin, something has to die. Blood has to be poured out. And so the system is instituted. And so all the way back, thousands of years ago, they would go to the temple and the priest would be there and every person, just imagine, can you imagine if we had to do this today? If y'all had to come in and you couldn't come into church unless you had a lamb, something that had to die. And you brought it to me and I just start killing them. (laughs) Okay, your sins are covered. You know how bloody this would be right here right now? Nasty. They did this for years. Knowing that truly God knew that the blood of an animal would never cover your sin. But it was a type and a shadow. It was a forecast of what was to come. And so Jesus became the perfect lamb, the sacrifice, what the scripture says, that when he died, because see, prior to Jesus coming, you had to constantly, every time you came to church, you had to bring a lamb to cover the sins that you did, and you know how much we all sin. Oh, y'all don't sin. Maybe it's just me. Okay. Maybe it's just me. It's just me. But they had to bring a lamb. Some people had to bring like 10 because they just committed 10 the last 10 minutes. (laughs) But anyways, they had to kill a lamb. They had to kill a lamb, and the blood was poured out. But they had to keep bringing a lamb because it wasn't good enough. But when Jesus died, he was the perfect lamb. He died once and for all, and it covered all of our sins once and for all time. Right? We don't have to, he doesn't have to keep dying. His death once, once, it happened once. So when Jesus came, he did away with this old system. And in Hebrews chapter 10, 
I encourage you, that's your homework. You can read Hebrews chapter 10. It talks about this old system that was under the law of Moses, how it was a shadow. It was a dim preview of the good things to come, the good things that were to come through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Jesus became that sacrifice once and for all. So I asked the question because this is how I think. When Jesus was growing up, was he a part of that old sacrificial system? Like, because that's what they did. They would go to the temple, and part of the system was they'd have to kill an animal to cover their sins. So my question was, well, did Jesus have to do that? And then how long did he do that? Well, Jesus died in 31 AD. And as far as we know, we know that he was at the temple all the time, so he was probably watching that take place. And if you can imagine him knowing that he was going to one day be the perfect sacrifice, watching them go through the routine of slaying these animals, but yet sitting there going, I'm going to do away with this system, and I'm going to be the one that will lay down my life, and my blood will be poured out once and for all so they don't have to keep coming and killing these animals. That is not covering their sin. And so then I realized, well, when did that sacrificial system really end? Well, in 70 AD, remember Jesus died in 31 AD, in 70 AD, the Romans came and destroyed the temple. And so that's when they no longer had a place to come and sacrifice these animals. And so that sacrifice, sacrificial system has ended, hasn't happened really since then. And then there had to be this teaching that began to help people to understand that Jesus became the perfect sacrifice once and for all. And this new covenant was established. In Matthew 26, verse 26, it says this. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed and broken, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. So there was the old covenant, this old sacrificial system. Jesus establishes this new covenant. So every time we take communion, which you can do any time, the Bible just says as often as you do it. In fact, I challenge and encourage you to do it at home. Take the time, sit with your family before you have a meal and just take a moment and reflect and just say, I'm going to do this in remembrance of God because if it wasn't for Jesus, we would be doomed. There had to be wrath for the sin that was in our life. And if it wasn't for him, this new covenant, man, I would suffer So this higher covenant offers us this opportunity to be reconnected to God, to have our sins uh, forgiven. And so there are some benefits, just like our natural blood benefits us, so the blood of Jesus benefits us. And I want to go through seven of them, and then you're going to help me preach. You ready? You ready? Oh, man. All right. We're getting good. All right. You with me? All right. Here we go. So here's the first thing. The blood of Jesus speaks better things. The blood of Jesus speaks better things. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24, it says, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Now, you have to know who Abel is. So Adam and Eve had some boys. Cain And Abel, Abel obeyed God and brought an offering. God received his offering. Cain didn't do it God's way. God rejected Cain's offering. Cain became jealous and he committed murder. And he kills his brother, Abel. And in Genesis 4, verse 10, it says this, the Lord said, what have you done? He's speaking to Cain. What have you done? And then he says, listen, your your brother's blood is, cries out to me from the ground. Now think about this for a second. He kills his brother and the blood is pours into the earth and God says, listen, your your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. That's what sin caused. But then when you begin to really look at this, Jesus became the second Abel. Except Jesus' blood as he hung on the cross wasn't just poured into the ground. 
Because the scripture says he rose again and he went to the father that was in heaven and he put his blood there. And so now every time the father looks at you, he doesn't look at what you did. He doesn't look at you through the lens of how you may see yourself. He sees you through the blood because Jesus' blood cries out for mercy where Abel's blood cried out for vengeance. Abel's blood... The reason why it cried out is because the generations that were in the bosom of Abel would never have the opportunity to see the light of day. Abel was able to worship God, but he'll never be able to teach his children to do that and his children's children and so forth and so on. And so that was crying out to God for vengeance. So Jesus, when he died, he's on the cross and he looks and he says to the father, he says, forgive them. For they know not what they do. It was mercy. And what was happening is Jesus' blood, now sprinkled in heaven, intercedes for you. And it pleads for you. And it says mercy, mercy. Every time you sin, every time you mess up, every time you blow it, every time you think that, oh my gosh, God will never forgive me. He forgives you, not because of what you did, but because of what Jesus did. His blood covers you. And it pleads for you. and intercedes for you. Abel's blood was shed against his will, but Jesus willingly gave his blood. Abel's blood was sprinkled on the earth, but Jesus' blood was sprinkled before God. Abel's blood called out for vengeance, but Jesus' blood pleads for mercy. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. That's what his blood does. So every time God sees you and judgment and wrath wants to come on you, you God can't do that. He won't do it. Why? Because the blood of Jesus cries out for mercy for you. So how do we apply that? This is where we're going to read together. They're going to put it up on the screen at all of our locations, and we're going to apply this right now to our life. I want you to read this with me. Ready? One, two, three. Thank you, Lord, that even when I cannot pray, the blood of Jesus is pleading for me in heaven. Think about that for a second. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood that cries out for me. Here's the second thing. The blood of Jesus provides forgiveness of sin. It provides forgiveness of sin. Matthew 26, verse 28. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Sin is defined as missing the mark, and the mark is to worship God through his son Jesus, right? So to recognize Jesus as Lord, uh, to not recognize Jesus as Lord and Savior is sin. But then there's these sins, on the other hand, these are the things that we do that are contrary to God's plan for our life. And we can name them, we, we start to name out all of these different things, whether it's uh, fornication, adultery, lying, stealing, pride, whatever. You, we start, you can list them all. We all have those things that we do most likely on a regular basis. Even though we don't want to do them, sometimes we do them. Why? Because darkness is in the earth. But thank God, God provided a way so that the penalty of our sin won't be brought upon us. It was brought upon Jesus, and his blood is sprinkled before God saying, ah, 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 ah. When God sees you, he sees you through the blood of Jesus. So watch this. Forgiveness of sin. Hebrew, uh, not, not Hebrews, it's uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says this. He says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So think about this for a second. When we give our life to Christ, the scripture says we are born again. Because before Christ, we were born into sin. We were born into darkness. We were born into uh, this world that is corrupt. So when I trust Christ, scripture says now I become born again. So the old things that were there, God no longer looks like I have an opportunity to start over and I start over with a clean slate and that clay, that slate remains clean because of the blood of Jesus Christ. So every time God looks at you, he doesn't look at your past. He doesn't look at who you were. He looks at where you were when you started with him. And he goes from now on through the blood of Jesus Christ, you are holy. You are redeemed. You are uh, uh, forgiven. Your sins are forever covered because of the blood 
of Jesus Christ. So what that means is this, that even generational sin, things that you can't even control, things that happen, that your parents did or your grandparents or your great-grandparents did, a lot of that stuff is passed down through the bloodline. And you, know, you act out things and you don't even realize that maybe that was passed down through the generations. Do you know that when you become born again, you have a new bloodline established by Jesus Christ and that old bloodline is cut off and it has no right to invade this new bloodline? So it is, it had the, you, and, and so often we don't walk in that revelation and that understanding and we put up with the things that really don't have a right to be there. I can't control what my great, great, great who did and I can't control what my parents did. But what I can do is apply the blood of Jesus so that when those things try to keep, creep up from my past, it has to pass through the blood and the enemy ain't passing through it because Jesus already kicked his tail. You just need to know that. The blood of Jesus is like our alarm system. What I love about the blood of Jesus, it's effective both backward and forward. Old things are passed away. No matter what you did yesterday. Sometimes we think that what we did yesterday or the day before or last week, that God can never forgive us, that I'm not worthy, that all of these things, that's a lie. That's where the seed that the enemy plants in your mind. But I want you to know that today you can apply the blood of Jesus and be reminded that you have been forgiven. So here we go. We're going to apply this. So I want you to read this with me. Everybody here. Ready? One, two, three, go. While I walk in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses me now and continually from all sin. Mm -mm -mm. Come on, somebody. Somebody want to clap right there. Here's the third thing. The blood of Jesus provides justification. Now, I know that's a big word. Bernard, why you got to give all that like, proving you all smart? I'm not that smart. It's a big word, but I'm going to break it down for you. Somebody say, break it down. <laughs> wicked, wicked, wicked. Here we go. <laughs> all right. Here we go. We're going to break it down. Romans 5, 9. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So justification is a process through which a person is declared not guilty. Imagine you did something wrong. You go to court and the judge gets up and says, not guilty. You have been justified. Now, the blood justifies us. And what that simply means is that you are justified. You're spared from God's wrath. And the reason why you are justified is because of the blood of Jesus. So when God looks at you and your sin should bring the wrath of God, God looks at you through the blood and says, you are justified just as if you'd never sinned. Justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. When Jesus looks at you, it's just as if you never sinned. I know it's mind-blowing, but you need to get that revelation because I'm so, so tired of the enemy beating us up in our minds thinking that, man, I'm just no good because I keep sinning. No, just shut the devil up and say, ah, I've been justified. And Jesus looks at me and says, I am not guilty because of the blood of Jesus Christ. So we're going to apply it. Let's apply this blood. Let's read this statement together. One, two, three. Through the blood of Jesus, I am justified, acquitted, not guilty, made righteous, just as if I'd never sinned. Whew. Come on, somebody. Let that soak in. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Here's the fourth thing. The blood of Jesus provides protection. The blood of Jesus provides protection. In Exodus, the children of Israel, they're slaves in Egypt. And Egypt had many, many, many gods. And our heavenly father, the true one and only God, was going to bring judgment on Egypt, mainly all of these gods. And he was going to prove that he was the one and only, and he was going to free the children of Israel. So he instructed the children of Israel. He said, listen, I want all of you to go find the lamb. I want you to slay it. I want you to go inside your house. I want you to eat all of it. And I want you to take the blood from that lamb and I want you to put it over your doorpost. And as you put it over your doorpost, there's going to be a death angel that is going to go through the city. 
And it is going to take the firstborn of every human and every animal. But if you stay in your house and you put this blood over your doorpost, that death angel will pass over your house and nothing will happen to you. Exodus 12, 7, uh, 12 and 13, it says this. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides of the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. And on that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. Now listen to this. He says, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. This is where Passover became a celebration. It became a time throughout history. They would go for Passover. Why? Because it was when the death angel passed over because of the blood and no harm was brought to the children of Israel. Now, what's really interesting, they were covered and they were protected by the blood of Jesus. The blood is the key to not being harmed. No one was spared because they were called Israelites. They were spared only by the blood. If they did not put the blood over the post, then harm would have come to them. There's a mystery in the blood of Jesus that can't be understood and it can't be comprehended by darkness or Satan himself, but God reveals it to us, his children. And when we enter into a relationship with God, the covenant with Jesus stands forever. And if we invoke this mystery of the blood, then we too are protected. Even in this land that we live in, when there's so much corruption and so much greed and so much sin, I am in this world, but I'm not of it. And I don't have to be affected by it because I put the blood of Jesus over the doorpost of my heart and all of the wickedness can try to come in, but it cannot stay. I have a Holy Spirit alarm system called the blood of Jesus that says, hey, 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 something's trying to get in. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Something's trying to get in. There's deception coming. Just wake up. I want you to know that I am protected by the blood of Jesus. The weakest part of the fortress that walled a city was was the gate or the door. A walled city. And when an enemy came, they tried to penetrate the door. The door of your heart is sometimes the weakest place. And that's why the blood of Jesus has to be applied over that door. And that's the power of his blood. It brings protection from the evil one. So that even when these these things come at us, it's like, uh uh-uh, the blood of Jesus. So how do we how we apply it? We're gonna apply it right here. Say this with me. One, two, three. Through the blood of Jesus, I overcome all the tactics of the enemy. I am protected physically, emotionally and spiritually from any ungodly weapon used against me. Mm. Number five. The blood of Jesus provides healing. Isaiah 53, verse five. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Healing is not a function of your righteousness. It is a function of the blood. The blood heals. It carries healing in it. Just like our blood in our natural body carries healing in it. And if you ever cut yourself, immediately blood comes to that area to create a clot so that you don't bleed out. There's healing in the blood. So when you are sick or when disease comes, or when created viruses are made, then all you have to do is say, no, 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 the blood of Jesus over this body right now. I cover myself with the blood of Jesus because the blood of Jesus protects me. There's red blood cells and white blood cells and all these things that are happening. Why do you just need to show? There's power in the blood. So let's apply it. Say this with me. One, two, three. Lord Jesus, when we receive your blood, In it, we receive your life, the life of God, divine, eternal, endless life. Just two more. The blood of Jesus provides sanctification. The blood of Jesus provides sanctification. Another big word. Hebrews 10.10 says, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Sanctified, it simply means you take the first part of that word, sanct, 
and it means holy. It means set apart. It's a process of being set aside for greater use. That you are set aside as an object of God's affection and his love for you. That we are truly the apple of his eye. We are sanctified. We're no longer just common, but we have royalty and divinity rolling through our bodies. We are made holy. We are righteous. And now when God sees us, he sees us as holy, just as Jesus is holy. In fact, you could say you are as righteous as Jesus because Jesus made you righteous. So how do we apply this? We're going to do it right now. Say this with me. Ready? One, two, three. Through the blood of Jesus, I am sanctified, separated from sin, set apart to God, made holy with God's holiness. My God, thank you for that. And here's the last one. The blood of Jesus provides redemption. Amen. The blood of Jesus provides redemption. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8. In him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and understanding. Redemption is extremely powerful. To redeem simply means to buy back. When we were in sin, before we knew Christ, we were owned, we were slaves to sin, is what the scripture says. Being slaves to sin, we were owned by the devil. Satan was our owner. He had us bound, chained. We had to do whatever he said. And nothing, nothing that we could do could ever get us out of that place. But Jesus came, he died on the cross, and his blood says, no, here is the payment for them. I'm going to redeem them. I'm going to free them. They are going to become my sons and daughters. I'm going to break the chains of bondage so that now sin no longer is their master, but I'm going to be their savior, and I'm going to allow them to become all that I've created and redeemed them to be. He bought us back with his own shed blood. Oh, I don't know if you truly understand. But I want you to know that when the enemy comes knocking at your door, telling you you're not good enough, lying to you, and saying that somehow, because of what you did or because of what you said, that you're going to miss out on God's best. Listen, I tell people all the time, if you mess up, you make up. But don't ever give up because God will never give up on you. So how do we apply it? Let's do this right here, right now. Say this with me. One, two, three. Through the blood of Jesus, I have been redeemed out of the hand of the devil. I've been redeemed. So that simply means that today you have an opportunity at all of our locations right here in this room. You have an opportunity to receive this incredible gift that God gave us called salvation, redemption, justification, sanctification, protection, healing. It all comes with just receiving what he's done for us. And so would you bow your heads and close your eyes at all of our locations? I want to extend this invitation to you right now. If you say, I'm ready to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, to receive this incredible gift of redemption, justification, sanctification, healing, mercy, he's made a way for you. I just want you on the count of three to lift your hand as an indication saying, yes, I'm ready to receive those things. One, two, three. Lift your hand all over this room. Whether you're online, that's it. Fantastic. All right, you can put your hands down. If you lifted your hand or desired to lift your hand, we're all going to pray this prayer together as a family. And this prayer is simply just affirming what you've already done, what God's already done in my heart. So let's say this with me at all of our locations. Father God, I believe that Jesus died for me. I repent of my sin and I thank you for saving me. I receive everything that your blood provides for me. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.